Hello, and welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. As you know, I'm doing a special segment as part of Sunshine talking about Jesus' second coming, and I think it's critically important that we do that because the time is short and he is coming soon. Every Bible scholar believes that. I believe that. So today I want to show you the country of Israel. I'm kind of working up to the second coming. I want you to be familiar a little bit with the country and with the things of this country. And and I think you'll find that Israel is a very, very beautiful country. So I'm going to start showing pictures of the country. But before I do, I brought some things in that I would very much like to have you see. As I mentioned, I showed you a couple of pictures last week. And uh, as, as I mentioned to you, Israel is basically a desert country. There's lots of desert. However, there's so much irrigation, they make use of every drop of water that they have. In fact, they have so much irrigation that they grow fruit and they're able to export fruit to other countries that can't grow their own because of the weather. So let me show you the sand and some of the things that I brought in, and then you'll have an idea as to what the country looks like and feels like. I've been there a number of times. I've been in the garden tomb, and I'm really anxious to show you these things. First of all, this cross is made out of Israeli sand. It is a sand cross. It's been heat treated, and that's the reason that you get the rippling effect. It is made to be hung on a wall, and it is fairly heavy. I'll show you the back side. It's plain, but it's all Israeli sand. All of Israel's land and sand and rocks have a kind of beigey look to them, and I'll be showing that to you as we go along. Kind of a light brown, white to light brown. That's because there's a lot of sandstone in the, in the country, also in the other Middle East countries. And there is a rule, I don't know if it's on the books now or not, but there was a rule when I was over there that all new buildings had to be built of sandstone because sandstone is very inexpensive. It's hard enough to be used for building. There's plenty of it. And that's the reason that some of the pictures that I show you today are going to look like they're beige colored. This is made from Israeli sand, heat treated. It is kind of heavy, made to hang on a wall. You can see the that there's a little place there that you can hang it on a wall. I don't do it because since it is sand, it's possible if you rub up against it that some of the sand grains come off. I know I've done it myself. So I keep it safe, and I'm, if I slammed it up against the wall or a door slammed up against it, I might lose part of it. So I, I just keep it in a box and keep it protected like that. Now, I do have olive wood. Olive wood comes from olive trees, as you know and they're very imp important to the country of Israel. Here is an olive wood cross. It's hand carved. They do a lot of jewelry, hand carvings, and they're beautiful. I almost wore this today. I have worn it before, but uh, sometimes I don't. If I think that they're frail, some of these crosses are frail. The wood tends to be heavy, but the way they loop the, the rope around it for you to wear, it can make them a little bit frail. But they do a lot of hand carvings. I I don't know, maybe it's best if I hold it down here for you to see, but it's olive wood. Olive wood is used, olives are wood for, f for food, they're used for fuel, the oil is used for fuel, they light candles with it, they use the oil for, for certain religious things that they do, and olive and olive wood are very important. I'll be showing you pictures of the olive trees. You can see I've got, uh, they, and they color them, they're a little bit colored. I have here too. Um, two hand carvings that are made for Christmas decorations. You can see Mary, you can see Joseph, and the baby in between them, if I hold them upright. But the reason I brought them in is the coloring of the olive wood. These are all hand-carved olive wood. You can see this is so much lighter, but you get gradations, you get striations in the wood, which makes it very beautiful. And you can see that in this one, because the darker parts are just the striations that are natural to the wood. And it's very, very beautiful wood. So anyway, I to show you that. Another example is this little hand-carved camel. I have a number of camels. This is one of the simpler ones. And you can see there's a light part here 
in the beginning, I don't know how to hold this to make it more visible, but there's also dark parts, and those that's just natural for the wood striations. On this side, you get more of the light, less of the dark, and this side you get more of the dark and less of the uh, uh, and less of the light. This is just this is just a, an inexpensive decoration. You can get jewelry. This is like hand carved olive wood as as a necklace. I have all kinds of things. I only brought in a few things. I want you to get a taste of things. Now, here's a hand carved communion cup. Communion is very important to the Christian tradition. Let me hold it down here. This is hand-carved olive oil. You can buy them in Israel. I have some a lot that come from Israel. This one does. Hand-carved olive oil. And you can see, if I hold it just right, part of it is light and part of it is dark. And that's just due to the natural wood striations. Nothing else but that. So, and I also brought in a stone. I was wearing this when I came in. I'll put it on at the end of the show. I don't know if you're going to be able to zoom in and see this or not. There is a stone, a light colored stone, right here where my finger is in the center of this cross. It's under a little plastic casing. It's just not hanging there by itself. This comes uh, as, a, uh, as a stone that most scholars believe that this is the place in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. This stone is attached to a much larger stone, and they built a church on top of the rock where it is, and they believe that was the area where Jesus was born. I know I bought this. I've, I've sent, I had to send for these, and I have a few others somewhat like them. And uh, the person, the moderator who was selling them on, uh, I guess it was one of the home shopping networks, say, uh, keeps saying, this stone may have well seen the birth of Jesus if it had eyes. And it's whitish, and some are beige. And what they've done is they've built a huge church over the area, over the rocks where they think that Jesus was born. And the government has given them permission to take little chips off the stone that go into these crosses. And these crosses are designed to look like the grotto that they have. They have a grotto which is like a cellarway, and it's for the birth of Jesus, to celebrate the birth of Jesus. There's no natural light there. It's all all lit by candlelight, and they have uh, things that to remind us in terms of Jesus' birth. I wish I could describe it further. If I can and I can find all my materials, I'll do a special show on it. But this rock comes from this one of the stones where they believe is very, very close to where Jesus was actually born. It's a very expensive cross. They've designed things around it, and the rest of the cross is designed to look like what that grotto is. It's designed after that grotto. So it's very interesting to see. Now let me get um, to uh, oh, communion. I showed you the communion cup. There's something else I want to show you in regards to that. This does not come from Israel. As you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And most churches can't do communion the normal way, which is passing it from hand to hand. So what some people have done with uh, unusual and wonderful ideas is a way to substitute. This is a little thing. It looks about the size of a creamer that you would get if you're going for a cup of coffee in a restaurant. It's all sealed. And on the top of that is a little wafer. Now, in most communion services, you have bread and wine, or you have wafers or crackers or grape juice or something like that. It's, it's meant to represent Jesus' body and his blood. And his body was sacrificed, and so that's what the wafer represents or the bread, whatever they use. And uh, the uh, grape juice or the wine represents his blood that was shed. So there's a little wafer on top of this. It's all sealed. You have to kind of look in. It's, it's a whitish area. And you peel the top off, and you have the wafer. And then you peel something else else off underneath it, and you get the little uh, grape juice, which this is, grape juice, in that little creamer-like thing. So you have the bread in the cup, the wafer in the cup, all in this. And usually if you're going to a church service, and many churches are doing this now because they are concerned about people getting sick, you take one when you go into church and you have it. And then when you have a communion service, it's not passed you hand to hand. You already have it in, by your side, you know, and then you do the service. I just want you to 
to see how human minds can somehow come up with things that, that are great. Now, I want to show you the pictures, and so we're going to start with this one right here. I showed you this last time. Israel is a lot of it is desert and you can see there are uh, little bushes there are outcroppings of, uh, of rocks and you wonder as you go through this how do people know where they're going because it's all the same sand dune after sand dune after sand dune and then you get to a picture that's beautiful and there's flowers and there's trees and all kinds of things all due to irrigation now, I'm going to show you, I showed you this last time, but I'll show it to you again. This is the Sinai Desert, and you can see the whole land area of the Middle East is very, very desert. I showed you that once before, and I'll put this one down. And I mentioned to you already about the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, and this is another good picture of the Dead Sea. And you can see that there, this is all salt all pictures of salt. There is so much sediment that you can't sink in the Dead Sea. You could walk out in the middle of the sea and not sink. And yet it's, it's quite a large sea. There are a lot of people that are afraid that it's evaporating to the point where maybe there won't be any more water in it. Right now there still is, but it gets a lot of water that goes into it, but it doesn't have any tributaries out of it, so it just sits there. And because of the heat of the Middle East, it is very very hot there. A lot of the water is evaporated and you get sediment that's left. And in some places you have these salt outcroppings. And one of the reasons that countries like to, out, uh, to, to fight against Israel and win against her is all of the natural resources that she has. She has a ton, millions and millions of dollars of natural resources. Now I'm going to show you Jerusalem and I talked a little about Jerusalem last time. You have an old city and you have a new city. This is a nice picture of the old city and there is a walkway, there is a wall that goes all around. You can see this wall, maybe not so clear in this picture, but you can see this wall. Right here is a beautiful building. I'm going to be showing it to you. It's called the Dome of the Rock or the Mosque of Omar. This is probably the second most important worship place for the Arabic nations. They treasure this and it's a very beautiful building. Over here, right behind it, there's a little tiny street that you cross and over here there's a little white spot. That is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's where the common everyday people worship and they don't usually use the big ones except for, for, for uh, dignitaries. Most common people, and that's almost everybody, use Al-Aqsa Mosque instead. This is the Kidron Valley. There is a bunch of trees and so forth there. There's a lot of, of cemeteries in that area, and there is a Golden Gate, which I am going to be showing you in a few minutes, that, that uh, isn't open, but most of the gates are. You can walk right into the Temple Mount. Here's the Mosque of Omar. It's more or less evening. You can see that it's built out of tiles. There are a lot of tiles, and there are a little archways here. The Kidron Valley is right down here. Lots of cemeteries there, and this is all the wall. Now you can walk around the wall, around the old city. You can actually get on top of the city and walk around the entire wall. It's called the Ramparts Walk. A little scary because Part of it is up pretty high, but actually very safe because there's always something to hold on to. Now this is a, an evening view of Jerusalem, and it's beautiful. Here's the Mosque of Omar. These are the archways I was telling you about. This is the Golden Gate. The Golden Gate, it shows up, it's a little bigger than the wall, it's a little taller than the wall, and it's closed off. You can't get through it. And the reason you can't get through it is that the Turks, now I've read this, I can't verify it, but I've read it, that the Turks in the 1500s heard that the scripture said that Jesus was coming back again, and they didn't want him to. So they thought if they blocked up the main gate to the old city, he wouldn't be able to get back because he wouldn't be able to get through a closed up wall. Because what the Bible actually says, he's going to come from heaven with his saints with him and step 
on the Mount of Olives with his foot, and the whole Mount of Olives is going to split. That's very clearly in the scripture. A simple wall would not prevent him from coming back. But I love the picture, so I've included it. Now here's another picture of the Mosque of Omar and the wall. When I say Mosque of Omar, I mean, you know, the, the Dome of the Rock. This is it right here. It's golden. They put the gold dome on it several years ago. It used to be a silver dome, but they then fixed it and did the, old, did the gold thing. This is the wall. This is also called the Wailing Wall. And there are cracks in the wall. And there are people there. And uh, they worship there by the Wailing Wall. And they are praying praying for peace and they are praying for their, their sense of the Messiah. They don't look at Jesus as being the Messiah, so they're praying for their Messiah to come. And women go on one side of, the, of this area and men go in the other. You don't see it here, but there's like a little barrier here. And they take their, their prayer requests and they write them on cards and they stick them in cracks in the wall. A lot of people do it, a lot of visitors do it as well, but this gives you a picture of the wall and gives you a picture of the Dome of the Rock. You don't see Aksa here, it's further back. So I'll, this is, but it's a gorgeous picture. Here's another picture that's like it. Uh, but you see a little, it's a little bit, you can see further. There are the Israeli flags right here. Now, of course, the Arabic people think they own it, but these are Israeli flags, and you can see the people milling around. The Dome of the Rock is right here. So this is a little bit distant. This is part of the, of the wall. It's all a part of the wall. It goes all the way around the Temple Mount and all the way around the old city. Now, I'm gonna show you some pictures, some more modern pictures of the Dome of the Rock. It's all tile, and it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. I've been in it. I don't think they allow anyone in it now. I'm not sure. But, they, but when, if you go in it, it's a huge, huge room with a big rock in the center of it. I mean a huge rock in the center of it. And you can walk around the rock if you can get in. They may only allow Arabic people in. You can't wear shoes. You have to wear your shoes on the outside and go in and either bare feet or stocking feet. But look at the tiles. Now the reason that they have this as a worship place is they believe that their prophet stepped on that rock and angels brought the prophet to heaven from that rock. That's why this is such an important uh, worship place for the Arabic people. They actually believe that their, their, uh, their spokesperson, their person who was the prophet, set foot on that rock and went to heaven. So this is basically a big, big room with nothing in it except for that rock. There is a downstairs area, or I've been in that area too, and they believe that that area, which is just a room, just a plain room, and very sm a lot smaller and crowded with people all the time, they believe that that room holds the souls of people who have died. And that's the, what a part of their belief system. So and this is the internal part of the Dome of the Rock. This is the rock I'm talking about. This is the whole room. Now, of course, it's the way that it's been photographed. This is the dome. It would go up to that area, which was had the gold dome. There is a cord, and, I've, and you're not going to be able to see it. I can, I can barely see it myself. It goes from the middle down to where this rock is. I have tried off and on to find out what that represents, and I can't because nobody seems to know. I've asked people who have gone on tour. I've asked tour directors, I've asked Arabic people, what does this cord mean? You can't see it, and this picture doesn't show it very well, but th there it is hanging, and nobody seems to know what it's for. It has some kind of significance, but uh, it's just a, like kind of a side thing. I've noticed it. Uh, let's see, here's the Wailing Wall, another picture of it. 
This is a little barricade, you know, kind of like a little fence, where women go on one side to worship and men go to the other side to worship. And they worship as close to the wall as they can get, and you get, can walk right up to the wall. There is some uh, greenery that is actually coming out of the wall because it's grown through it, and these are all like tiles. This is part of the wall. Now, you don't see the Dome of the Rock. It's hidden. This wall is high, and the, at the angle that it was taken, you don't see it, but it's behind there. Now, here's a picture of the old city of Jerusalem. Now, I mentioned to you before that all of the buildings have that beigey look, that colored look. These are all of those buildings. Here's a part of the wall. The Dome of the Rock is right here, but you can see that, that the whole buildings are kind of like beige colored. That's due to the stand sandstone that they have been built with. Now, some of the roofs of the buildings are humped, and some of them are flat. And uh, the Israelis and the old Jewish people thought that if you had humps in the roof, it made the roof stronger. And so therefore it could take more weight because some people actually lived on the roofs of their houses because it was so hot. It was the only cooler place they could get at night to sleep. And if they had guests, they would use put guests on the roof of their house for the same reason. It was more spacious and it was cooler. So some of the roofs are humped and some of them are not. Some of them are flat. This is a citywide area and most of them are flat. You sometimes see red red roofs and so forth. The dome is right here. But I wanted you to see the coloration of the city, all, be all practically beige. Now I'm going to show you some of the gates. The old city has, has, uh, has gates around the Temple Mount. I showed you that last time. I hope that you can remember it. The Temple Mount is that square. Maybe I should go back and find a map here and kind of review that if I can find it easily without taking up too much time. Um, okay, I, I've got something I can show you here. This is a map of the old city of Jerusalem, which I drew out. And this area, this square here, squarish area is called the Temple Mount. The rock of uh, the dome of the rock is seated right here. Jerusalem is like right here on the side, although I didn't measure it in. This is all the uh, what's called the Temple Mount. So this area has got uh, you can get right up to it. But there are gates around the old city, and I mentioned the last time I was here: the Jaffa Gate, the New Gate, the Damascus Gate, Herod's Gate, uh, the Lion's Gate, the Golden Gate that I showed you right here, uh, the, the Dung Gate, Zion Gate, and uh, Dome of the Rock is like right here, El Aksa is right here. Now what's the reason for the gates? Gates were put up around cities to protect the cities. These gates are, go are gorgeous. They're like archways, and you can walk right through them. And so what I'm going to do is show you some of those gates now in the old city of Jerusalem. And this is the Golden Gate that's been closed up that I told you about that the Turks closed because he didn't want it open. This is, uh, let's Herod's Gate right here. Now they're like archways. You can go and walk right through them. You can't the Golden Gate, but you can walk through these gates. You can take cars through these gates. Let me show you some more. This is the Dung Gate. St. Stephen's Gate. This is the Zion Gate, and this is the Golden Gate that I've already talked about. They're like archways. You can see the people go right in and out of those archways. You can walk right in, in and out of the city of Jerusalem just going through the archways, with the exception, of course, of the Golden Gate, which is closed. And it's the only gate. Now, there were more gates. There are eight gates now. There were more gates in history, but some of them, of course, during battle were lost and built up and all of that. This one right here is the Damascus Gate. It's a gorgeous gate. See the horde of people? They're walking back and forth and back and forth. Now, I've been in that gate. I've been in all of them. But in this gate, 
I, I spent quite a bit of time because scholars know for sure that Jesus used a gate and he used this gate and he walked back and forth. So it's a gate that Jesus traveled. So a lot of people want to walk in that gate because of that. And I did the same thing, of course, as well. So that's the Damascus gate. Now, this is the garden tomb. This tomb is the, the tomb where Jesus was buried, and I truly believe it is the tomb. You know, people will say, this is a tomb. No, not there, here instead. I really believe that this is a tomb because it has all of the biblical things about it that the Bible mentions were prevalent at the day that Jesus was buried. So I'm assuming that this is correct, and this was, this was uh, uh, the garden tomb. Now I'm gonna have to, I've only got two minutes left. Let me show you one more picture and I'll get back to it because obviously I need more time to finish. So we'll have to do this. This is uh, a skull, it's called Skull Hill. The reason that people believe that what the picture I just showed you is the tomb of Jesus is because the Bible says he was buried by the place of the skull. Now, this is called Skull Hill. It's right beside the tomb. There was an Englishman, the English owned that whole territory in history, and one of the soldiers who was stationed there said he wanted to find the, the, the tomb of Jesus. And he walked around and walked around the whole area, and he looked, and there was Skull Hill right there. And he knew that the Bible said that, that Jesus was buried at the place of the skull. So he knew his tomb had to be near. And this is the place of the skull. If you look at it just right, when the light hits it, it's a very large hill. You can stand in front of the tomb, look up to your right, and it's just like towering there. And when the light is right, it looks exactly like a skull, more so even than this picture. But you can see how this picture makes it look like a skull. Now I'm going to have to close it here because I've run out of time, but I am going to continue this next session. And so uh, we, we uh, I'm sorry, Rick, I should have given you more time. I didn't even think about it till I saw the clock. So at any rate, we will be continuing with this on the next session. And, I, and uh, so I hope that you will continue with me because Israel is a very, very beautiful country. So we'll close it here. Please join me next time.